Hi, my name is Karim Momri, and welcome to Engineering and Entrepreneurship. So before we get started right into this video, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and like this video. As well as if you have any suggestions for videos, please put them in the comment section down below. My name is Karim Momri from Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. I'm an engineer with Comrie Engineering, a firm I founded in 2016. We provide primarily structural, mechanical, and electrical engineering services. Our key markets are residential and commercial and primarily in restoration. I plan on bringing you an in the trenches perspective, essentially a day in the life of an engineer. Most of the videos that are coming up are going to be primarily on restoration and fixing existing damages to structures. From this series, I'm hoping that I'll be able to show you different sides of being an engineer. Every day is a little bit different. There's always a different problem, a different challenge. And hopefully I'll take you guys with me and be able to solve these together. The channel's going to be focused on both engineering and entrepreneurship. So I have been a bit of a serial entrepreneur starting my first business at 15 years old. I've gotten on the stage a few times to share my experiences with others and I figured it'd be time to start a YouTube channel. I'm hoping to start doing a video weekly. It's gonna be one week on entrepreneurship and one week on engineering and hopefully alternating between the two. So this week we're gonna be talking about a simple project. We were essentially called because a homeowner noticed some sagging in her floor or some delamination in the uh, in the laminate in the floor and uh, she wanted a structural engineer to come in and provide a professional opinion. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be taking you guys through that. Unfortunately she said that we weren't able to film. So I'm going to kind of show some pictures and hopefully convey the information as best as possible. Typically on these projects, our firm will send an engineer and a technologist to go assess the situation. So on this one, myself and a technologist went to the site. We met with the homeowner and that's how we start every site visit. We essentially do an interview, try to understand what happened, the history. In this case, she explained to us that she bought the house eight years ago. And over time, it's been sagging more and more and more. So essentially that's telling us that something is yielding. We, uh, we went in, we did a structural review. So essentially we reviewed the area that she was concerned about. We reviewed the general framing to understand essentially how the structure was built. Uh, we also tried to determine what loading was on this beam. So we, we examined the roof structure to determine if there was any, any load bearing walls that were bearing on the floor and that, that could have been causing some additional loading. Uh, in this case, there wasn't, but that's always a good thing to check. We were able to check also the, the, the way that the floor joists were running. Once we're on site, we almost make sure to do a floor plan, essentially understanding where the beam is so that when we go to run our calculations, we'll know what the, what the loads are, what the areas are, and what the spans are. So we could get a really accurate sizing of what the, the beam member should be and how to repair the structure. One of the key elements to residential restoration engineering is really understanding the typical construction and typical framing practices done. If you guys want to see something like that, please leave it in the comment because that's something that we have a lot of experience in and really understand. That would essentially include determining load paths, determining anything really about the residential structural framing. We always make sure that we have a lot of pictures on site visits. That's something that's extremely important and I, we can't stress enough. Always take as many pictures as we can because we don't want to go back. Once we get into the office, we get into the analysis, we want to be able to reference some pictures quickly and really make sure that we have a really good understanding of what's going on. We want to make sure that whenever we go and work on the project again, it might be in a day, it might be in two days depending on what the workload is, we want to be able to go through those pictures and really understand and remember what we saw that day because there's so many things going on in a day and so many different projects that you want to make sure that you almost have a fresh set of eyes. Once we get back to the office, the technician typically takes the floor plan that we drew on site and models it in Revit. It's essentially a 3D software that allows us to do drawing. The and I usually here we've been working together for a long time. They, they typically know how to size these members, but in some cases they'll send it to me and then we'll, we'll size it together. So I almost start up by opening up the floor plan in Revit on one screen and reviewing the notes as well as the photos from site. When we were on site, we almost take good salient notes and we want to make sure we remember them as soon as we start working on the project. Since we do the site visit a couple days before we start physically working on the project in the office, it's really important for us to have fairly recent understanding of what, what the framing systems are and we want to make sure we don't forget any key elements of the framing that might impact the design. The repair in this case will consist of replacing the beam, which is currently a free ply 2x10. So right now it's essentially dimensional lumber. We might decide to go to an engineer lumber or as we uh, increase the number of plies depending on what we decide from a calculation or we'll likely have to support the floor joists during the repair and the removing of the beam because once we remove the beam nothing's going to be supporting the floor joists and we want to make sure there's no further damages to the structure so in this video i'll primarily be discussing the design and sizing of the new beam but it's always important to have a structural engineer design the temporary supports uh, throughout the renovation of your structure because like i said there could only be, always be movement that could cause further damages to the structure in this case we're only supporting the floor load since all the walls on the main floor aren't supporting the ceiling. Essentially, there's no internal load bearing walls because of the, uh, the roof framing. From there, we determine the tributary width, which we measured on site. In this case, the beam that we'll be replacing is only supporting the floor 
Since we determined that none of the walls in the interior space are load bearing, that's because the, the roof framing system uh, transfers load to the outer walls. Please comment below if you think that that's something we should do a video on. From there, we determined the tributary width, which will allow us to convert our area loads to line loads, which will allow us to size our beam. In this case, we have a live load of 40 pounds per square foot, or 1.9 kPa as per the Ontario Building Code. That's for the live load, and then for the dead load, we have 15 pounds per square foot, or 0.75 kPa due to the floor assembly we determined on site. The tributary width is essentially the distance that the beam will be supporting. So essentially, in this case, it's going to be the full width of the house divided by two, since the outside wall will each be taking a quarter of the load. When sizing a beam, there are two major criteria for limit states design. The ultimate limit state, ULS, which is essentially ensuring that the beam won't fail or yield under the factored loads. For this, we almost check the bending capacity as well as the shear capacity. The other limit state is a serviceability limit state, or the SLS, which essentially makes sure that the beam doesn't deflect too much. There are tables in the building code for, based on the application and the finishes to ensure that you don't have any cracking or further damages, which is essentially one of the issues that happened here was that uh, there was some, some cracking in the laminate flooring due to excessive deflection. So think of this as the comfort criteria. While the beam may never break, the client doesn't always want to be patching cracks or fixing damage to the laminate. They also don't want to feel like they're on a trampoline when walking on the floor. Here you can see me determining the limit states and trying to size a 3 ply 2 by 10 SPF Select Structural. Currently the beam is a 4 ply 2 by 10 so based on the beam pockets currently in the foundation, we don't really want to change the depth of the beam. We can play with the width because we do have some space in the beam pocket to allow for a, you know, a 4 ply beam or 5 ply beam if required. The other option is to go from a dimensional lumber, so in this case we're dealing with a 2x10 which is something you can buy your local hardware store, or we could go to engineered uh, lumber such as an LVL or a glue lamb. Uh, something like that which is a higher capacity than the typical dimensional lumber. So here based on my calculations you can see that I'm, uh, I'm sizing it and I, I determined that we could probably get away with a 5 ply 2x10 uh, SPF select structural. So this is me checking the ULS, uh, then we have to check the SLS to make sure it's adequate. So in this case we'll be using a deflection criteria of L over 360. So the span, which in this case is, is the length, divided by 360 is the maximum deflection that we're allowed to get. So after running the numbers, I determined that the beam works for this application. Uh, again, we could have went with a, uh, an engineered lumber for this, which has some advantages, such as not needing as many plies, and it lowers the cost of construction. So if you'd like to learn more about the advantages of engineered lumber versus dimensional lumber, please leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe so that when these videos do come out you don't miss a thing. The last step is to update the drawings with the sizes and lamination method. So essentially as per the wood design guide we specified how the plies are laminated together. Once the drawings are reviewed, finalized and updated I send them back to the tech who does once again a once over to make sure that there's no other issues. They send them back to me for final review and sealing. Once I've finalized the review uh, we print them off in 24 by 36 uh, and they're ready for permitting so that the, the client can hire a contractor and get the work performed as soon as they can. So the drawing just came off the printer and they're all ready to go and ready for the client to pick up. So please, thanks again, I really appreciate you watching my first video. Make sure you please subscribe to the channel and comment for any potential future video you'd like to see. Thanks again for watching and on to the next one.